Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. And, uh, Alex, do you want to roll for initiative? Nope. Okay, well, you don't... <laughs> you have you have no initiative today? I have <laughs> my, no initiative. My initiative ran to, to one. Um, so I wanted to do something today. Uh, we have not actually had an episode where we talked specifically about dice mechanics since, like, 20 Sides of Die, which was back... Uh, like our third episode ever. <laughs> that's a few episodes ago. Yeah, that's that's 200 plus episodes uh, back. When we did that episode, I started to realize that I was highly confused even afterward. I was uh, I was still not really familiar with how dice worked in general. Now I have played with said dice and I understand them a little bit better. I wanted to kind of dig into the overall uh, mechanics of dice and how they work and why you want to choose certain uh ways to use them i was kind of wondering this is your personal preference obviously but what is your favorite die what oh. is your favorite polyhedral die of all, uh, of all of them? probably probably d20 it's aesthetically it's, very pleasing too it's very pleasing to look at uh they can have a lot of different patterns it's got a nice range of numbers and it's got a very nice uh way you can divvy out you know percentages as well so it's like five percent basically per yes Usually when I see a percentage die, it's like those big 100 dies. Sometimes, yeah. Uh, uh, but then you can also use 10s. You yep, have the 10s. You tens can use the, the D1000, which is the... We, we've been over this. Anyone listening to the show is probably familiar. It's the 10-sided dice that goes up by 10s, not 1s. The thing I was kind of curious about, though, me personally, is when you're looking at that 10 die and you see, like, the double zeros, is that representative of zero or representative of 100? <laughs> Uh, it depends on what the other dice you're rolling with it is. Well, if I roll like a nine and two zeros, that's not definitely not nine hundred. <laughs> yeah, then you would have a nine. So right. if you roll double zeros and a zero, you've got a hundred. If you roll double zeros and a uh, digit one through ten or one through right. nine, rather, you've got a single digit. So basically, I'm looking for three zeros in a row, tic tac toe. I'm looking pretty good. Yeah, and see, in some of those, it. Doesn't work too because sometimes the D10 instead of having a zero on it will have a ten on it, right? And so right. you're like, oh wait, we've got a double zero ten, yeah, and that yeah, it, it it would just be the same thing. That might be the reason why some people pull out the hundred so that the confusion isn't quite as great. And then and then you've um, always got the question of when you're using percentile, it's like, all right, if you have to get say below or above a certain number. I think that that's one of those things. Maybe this is the reason why it got a little confusing is uh you kind of have to figure that out in some ways on the table and certain people's preference about how they read those uh for the for the individual tens. If you had a 100 die, I mean obviously whatever the number that it lands on is the number that it lands on. But I mean if you wanted to simplify it, you could always just use your 20 sided die and just do it in in steps of 5. That was also another thing I was uh, fascinated with. It's not something that it's it's used very often, but I did see that you can have them custom made. You can actually have dice made in any number of sides you care to have. That's unfortunate. If you want a 23-sided die, you can buy a 23 well, <laughs> All right, so first of yeah. all, what are you going to use it for? Second of all, if you're going to have a game that requires that, for instance, yes, in an RPG especially, mm -hmm. how are you going to make sure your people that are playing your game and your, your storyteller and your, and your players have a 23-sided dice? What you do is you take a 20-sided die, and then you just put three sides on it. You just add three sides. <laughs> you just throw it in. This is what I would use a twenty-three sided die for. You have one through twenty, and then you have uh, then you have three more levels of critical. <laughs> you have a critical is twenty. Uh, a, a twenty-one is a super critical. Twenty-two is an ultra critical, and then in twenty-three is an ultimate critical. I don't think that's how that works. Yeah, it t well, it could. I mean, if you wanted to, you could make it work. It would be a horribly broken system. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> It doesn't, it's not going to be a good system, but you could do it. So, yeah, again, here's the thing. Yes. I don't 
see a reason for a side a, a dice with any number of sides that you want, for instance, because mm -hmm. like, what do you need a seven sided dice for? What do you need a nine sided dice for? I need a seven sided die to determine which one of the deadly sins I am. Oh, yeah. <laughs> see, I came up with a good reason. All right. So, what do you need a thirteen sided dice for? Um, to determine how unlucky I am. All right. And if so, I have Triskaidekaphobia. The other thing about bows is, if you have a dice with an odd number of sides like that, they're not going to roll quite the same as the other dice. Mm. Because yeah. there's an odd number of sides. I think the way I've seen them built, when, when they are custom built, is they kind of assume a sphere, and then they kind of carve off parts of that sphere in equal portion, and they put the numbers on it. So there's kind of like a, a generally round shape to them, and then there's like sliced off parts that are almost like little circles on top of them that are evenly spaced around it. Um, so you have... Uh, you essentially have an equal chance of landing on any of them, but it it de it definitely looks like you had to custom build this yeah. as a die. Usually, you will have an even number of sides. Usually, right? yes. Usually, yes. It's it's kind of tricky to have it with an odd number of sides because dice don't really want to do that for symmetry. Now, the thing that I was uh, wondering about since we've really haven't talked a lot about the random number generation element of dice is why you would want to pick certain dice for certain things i mean we've seen d20 systems before uh D, D obviously is a famous one but they've they're used for a lot of different systems but that's not the only kind of system that you can see you've seen d6 systems you've seen d12 systems we just talked about avarice not too long ago that uses a d12 why would you want to pick a specific kind of die for your game? What's the benefit of using one over another? Well, if you pick one specific dice over any other type of dice, say you pick the d20 or you pick the d12, you've got a set amount of probability on that dice to get X amount of rolls. So depending like how many different types of outcomes you want, you might want a different side of dice. Say mm -hmm. you um, wanted like three outcomes, but an even amount of numbers of chances for each thing, you could go with like a D6. Because then each right. outcome would be given two sides of the dice, which I believe would be like a fudge dice. Um, okay, yeah. So it's got yeah. the two pluses, two minuses, and then two blanks. Um, that, for instance, there's a finite probability that you can get. All right, you've got a two and six chance each roll individually to get each specific thing. Or, right. you know, the other way of saying that would be saying you have one in six chance for each face of that dice to turn up. Right, right. Now, I'm not really good with probability. Dice probability is interesting. Uh, when you go into actual probability statistics and actually run crunch the numbers of, like, the odds of getting things, mm. that's a little different. Um, mm. I do not know the math for that. I know people crunch those numbers, though, and they can tell you, yeah, well, if... Your your twenty is a crit, you know. For instance, right, you are going to potentially roll, like roll that one every x amount of rolls, right. And then if you go and you need to confirm the critical with another twenty, then your chance of getting a back to back twenties is mm. a lot. You know, there's a larger probability of that not happening. And right. so, the thing about all of the probability of dice really boils down to the fact that it doesn't really matter what the probability is because mm. it's still just random chance. Right. And theoretically, theoretically, like if I have a D20 in my hand, it should pretty much have a 1 in 20 probability of landing on any given number. Theoretically. And theoretically, but that's, <laughs> that's not how probability works with things like that because mm. it assumes that for the first one, they're, they're separate circumstances. So, like, to roll a 20 on the first one is, is one in X amount. And then to follow that up with rolling another 20 is oh, yeah. a, a much... The, it's, it's like... One in 400. When you buy lottery, t lottery yeah. tickets, for instance, yeah. and people go, oh, if I buy two lottery tickets, I've doubled my chances of winning. Right. And it's like, no. <laughs> Each one of those lottery tickets has a one in, you know, one million chance. 
Right. It's right. It, they do not stack. They're not cumulative, cumulative adding up to that chance. So if you buy a million mm-hmm. lottery tickets, you don't have, oh, I went from one of the million to a million out of the million. No, you've made the pool of lottery right. tickets get bigger, first of all. <laughs> and the second of all, each one of those has a one in one million chance. You just have a million yeah. chances. Because with, with lotteries especially is that no one might win. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. If you um, were saying like a million people went in and one person is going to win, and that's a guarantee, then you could probably say but that. But that's not because the way they pull works. the way they pull numbers for lottery. Yeah. I mean, you've got what like nine it's different numbers randomized, and it's yeah. the randomized and it's like so you have one sequence of numbers you get. In this case for the lottery, it's you get the one sequence and you have to match all like six numbers. Each one of those has a value of like one to whatever. Yeah, I can't remember. It's, it's, 64, yeah, one to a hundred maybe. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. And so it's you have to match each of those in order. Right. And it's like that's such a low probability. That's why the chance of winning the lottery is like you, you're more you're more likely to get struck by lightning. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, lightning lightning will definitely want to hit somebody. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it wants it wants to desperately. The lightning wins the lottery. That would be really cool. Now, the the thing though that I kept wondering, pondering about was uh, like usually a D twenty, for instance. A D twenty is usually used by itself. Uh, a lot of times when I see uh, somebody roll a d20, it's not rolled with additional dice. It's usually not part of a dice pool. Or if it is, that's usually a pretty high deal. Um, I'm playing in uh, 1879 right now, and you actually could use d20s as part of a dice pool for doing it, but you have to be up to, like, step 40 or 45 by the time your dice pool is that large where you're using dice that high. Yeah. That's a super high-level character you have at that point that can pull that kind of stuff off. Right. Um, But typically, if you're looking at a dice pool, you're going with some smaller numbers, which don't have as much swing to them, but theoretically could produce almost as high a number. So, like, for instance, I got two dice here. want to talk a little bit about your D6 and your D12. Okay. Now, theoretically... Theoretically, uh, a D6, if I had two of them, will go from 2 to 12. That's, that's, how, that, that's my number range. Uh, a D12 will go 1 to 12. Right. So, so theoretically, these two are, are pretty much in the same number range, except that like 1 just can't get to, to 1. Um, I think if you throw double 1s on a 6, though, that's still bad. <laughs> I mean, but. yes, if you, if you roll Snake Eyes, that's, that's still bad, but that's it still bad. is better than... Okay. Depending what you're using the dice for, it's still better than rolling a 1 on a 12, because you have 2 instead of 1. Right. So right. you've still doubled the base outcome. And that's right. that's one of those things with like D&D and Pathfinder and stuff, or, or most of these D20 games. You've got your great sword, which does 2d6 damage. But then you've got your great axe, which is 1d12 damage. Yeah. So it's the difference between the two is one's got a higher chance of minimum damage, which is your great sword, because you're rolling two dice. Your minimum is always going to be higher on the dice roll than your great axe. Right, right. Even if it's by one point, the point is you are adding that one extra damage. Your maximum mm-hmm. before chancing for criticals is the same. So obviously the great sword, in that sense, raw damage output would be better. It's got the better dice. Right. It's got right. it's got the more favorable minimal damage outcome um, in the same amount of high damage outcome. The mm. difference between the two typically ends up being the threat range or yeah. the critical damage they do. In older editions, I know great axes would do uh, three times damage on a critical hit, where great yeah. swords, I think, would still just do two. So you right. get the great sword, which has better minimum damage, but you have a great axe that has a chance of doing outrageously more damage. I mean, in general, your odds of hitting a 6 on a d6 are better than hitting a 12 on a d12. <laughs> theoretically, <laughs> like, yeah. Theoretically. And if you were rolling gonna... 2, you know, you're, you're in pretty good straight. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's like a 1 in 6 and a 1 in 12 chance, generally. Um, yeah, but... um, and then you get into the probabilities of actually rolling, like, two sixes. And... Right. Right, right. I think yeah, it's like I, 1 in 36 rolls would, or something like that. It would have like to that. be 1 in 36, you would get two sixes, so. 
So there's where it gets a little bit interesting, is that if you were to try and roll max damage on 2d6s, it's actually far less likely than rolling it on a d12. Um, yeah. It's 1 in 36 versus a 1 in 12. But the interesting thing that I find, if we're talking about swing and how dice swing, is uh, theoretically, you know, and, and different dice work differently. I know some dice are just generally bad, and you should put them in dice jail. Too many people have told me yeah, about that's, dice that's jail. Funny. Dice yeah. shaming is a thing. I've I have had a few dice where they like insist on rolling the lowest numbers <laughs> every single time, and then then they make it up to me with like a critical. Yeah. But but on something I don't need it for, <laughs> the thing yeah. I don't require it for. But if you were to look at like a d12, you can theoretically say that you're going to land on one to twelve pretty much consistently. Like the the odds of you landing on any of those are pretty much even. Yeah. Um. If I were, however, to roll 2d6s, now I have a bell curve, because the likelihood of me hitting 7 is actually far higher by the average of the two dice. Right. Is that one of the reasons why you would want to try using dice pools, where you're trying to get a better overall average in general? Um, or, or a lower average, yes. Possibly. I mean, dice pools can be interesting, because depending on how they're used... And what mechanics you keep with them, like does the roll and keep or just the dice pool itself. Uh, right. They're both dice pool type systems. Mm -hmm. So your normal dice pool is you roll X dice and you add those up to get your outcome. Mm -hmm. um, roll and keep, on the other hand, I know we've talked about before, is you roll X dice and you only keep a Y amount of actual dice to try and get your target. Right. So it's in that case, you're doing a dice pool, but you get to discard your least favorable outcomes. Yeah. yeah. Potentially. I, I mean, you could have disadvantage and have to... Uh, I mean, imagine a roll and keep system where you have advantage and disadvantage, mm -hmm. and you get disadvantage and you have to discard your favorable outcomes. Yeah. Or that your most be... favorable. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that would be a really interesting thing to see. I don't think I've seen that. Yeah, that feels like a Call of Cthulhu kind of thing, <laughs> giving yourself the worst possible lease out of the system. That feels like a almost an advantage-disadvantage kind of situation in a rolling keep system itself, Yeah, where I have to get rid of my most favorable uh, uh, types of, of dice. I, I could see that mechanic actually working for tension. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, because it's like, hey, you get to roll five dice, you only get to keep three, but you've got <laughs> insanity or whatever, you're, you've got disadvantage, we're going to call it for yep. the purpose of this. Uh, yeah. And so disadvantage is uh, you need to discard, if it's roll five, keep three, you need to discard the two most favorable dice. Right, right. So and, your two best dice. And then you make them roll them individually. You have <laughs> to have do one. And then another. <laughs> yeah. No, there's that's tension. Just time, just time consuming. Then, but there's, but that, but that is tension. You can create good tension. So, so in that way. case, you'd be going, okay, cool. So I kind of thought I was gonna do really good, but then it turns out I didn't do quite as good as I thought I was gonna do potentially. Right. That actually brings me to. I know this is kind of a side topic, but concerning dice is, I have not had to make like a D and D character by doing. Oh no, actually, I did. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, uh, roll stats? What For rolling the stats, right, with the with the d20s. Typically, I don't remember how d20s? many dice you're supposed to... Yeah, don't you roll the d20s for the stats, for your initial no, stats? I no, I've never... I mean, you can, if you're okay. being really crazy. Uh, <laughs> I've never, ever seen a game, like, oh. in all seriousness, played where you roll a d20 for your stats. Oh. Like a one, a goofy one-shot, maybe? Yeah, but but you've got such a a wild card there, yeah, of being above or below average by a far margin. What do you, you typically roll? Uh, depending on which system, like D and D, there's a couple different things. Um, if you're going really old school, you draw you roll three d six and take it the uh the score. Okay, um, and just gotcha. take that number and do it. Old school, old school, I guess, if you want to go. There are people who will go, so you need to roll 3d6, and the first one you roll is your strength, second one you roll is your dex, and you put them in oh, order yeah. of the way you roll them, so you have no say in what your stats are yeah, um, and how they're arranged. That's like Typically, OG though, d and <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's that's the, that's the Grognard d d The other one you can do, uh, a lot of people I know, do the roll four keep three 
Um, okay, yeah. So that is that is technically a roll and keep system. It is you roll a four and you keep the three best dice. Yeah, um, I do a variant of that myself. Typically, when I'm gaming, I do roll four, keep three, but re-roll ones. Oh, okay. Just so your character isn't like, let's say you get three ones. Yeah, your stat is three. <laughs> it's like no, you're yeah, gonna re-roll gonna those because you have to. Yeah. Like, I know, I know it's fun to play a flawed character sometimes, but yeah. it's also fun to play a capable character. I'd like to be because able to do something. <laughs> if you're com- that flawed. Yeah. And yes, I, I mean, most play- people now do let their characters and their players assign the stats to the, the class so that right. you're optimized typically for your class, mm-hmm. uh, unless you're playing the bard, uh, like Shump, yeah. who was not optimized for being a bard. He was optimized for combat and his charisma was pitiful. But that was, that was the character itself. That was the right. point of the character. Right, right, right. Yeah, I I have a monk that's terrible at dexterity. Yeah, and that's the point of the character. Yeah, but then then the thing is is that that's kind of offset by the fact that since Rembrandt's a turtle, his AC is still really good. <laughs> yeah. So so the dexterity doesn't really affect him quite as much, just for some of his skills. But do you prefer like I I, I don't know your personal preference, but do you prefer that to the more modern idea of the point by system? I've never, aside from video games, ever really used a point by system in a game. Oh, okay. Um, and I know a lot of video games uh, take that, like the uh, Neverwinter Nights, or mm. uh, I think Pathfinder Kingmaker has one too, that I- I've been playing a bit of that off and on. Right. Because uh, it's Pathfinder. Yeah. Outside of a video game RPG, I've never really dealt with a point by system. Mm. In, okay. in theory, they're fun. Yeah, because you can really pump your points into whatever you want. You can you can min max your character to your heart's content with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think I think the issue I have with them is that you do tend to min max your character when you do that. Right. It leads and, to very very optimized characters who don't necessarily I mean, have as much. I don't necessarily even in like Fallout, for instance. Yeah. Um, yeah. You've still got your special, which is still a point by system because you can have X amount of special points to put into your stats. It's not a f- real point by system where typically the point by system in D and D is uh add you it costs one point until a threshold then it costs two points and three points yes um yeah it's a one for one with mm-hmm. fallout yeah it's you have 10 points put them where you want and it's a one for one basis then mm-hmm. um yeah you want to have max strength stats. at the beginning you can do it just go for it yeah that's the thing it's a lot of people like in me in video games with the point by system i will kind of go heavy on the main stats my character needs like the main two stats that are important right. for the class. Right. And then right. I'll kind of break even with the rest of it. I'll make like a third one kind of high-ish and the rest I'll try not to have negatives in. Right. I want like a plus one in most things. But yeah. you don't have to do that. I could totally optimize to fully go like all in on one stat or two stats and then oh, yeah. give everything else negatives. Right. It would right. just you would you would suffer in a lot of places. And that's that's the thing. Right. It's uh, it's the idea that point by is self-regulating because of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah there's no in, randomization. You're, there's no randomization, all right. all and right it's there. you know what you're building. So if you want to go all in on strength and then like have five uh, constitution, yeah. So you're not get, you're gonna have negative to your hit points every time you level. Right. It's like, all right, you know what you're doing, right? That's the thing. It's you can really customize how that works with the point by system. Right. Right, right. Um, yeah. whereas the randomization, you have a bit better averages, typically. Well, yeah, and I, there are some character classes where you can say, like, uh, can I just have my charisma be zero, because I yeah. don't need it <laughs> at all, and I'll put all of my stats into everything. I think that, though, though if I remember from, like, uh, building characters in, like, D&D Beyond, that they do typically say that there's, like, a minimum you're supposed yes. to put your stats at. <laughs> there's a minimum for most of your stats. Yeah. There's, um, there's at least you can't like, have a... Eight, I think. No, you no? can have lower than eight. Okay. You don't really want to go lower than eight, but you can have lower than eight. Right. Intellect, you usually don't want to go lower than three, because one mm-hmm. and two is wild animal. Mm-hmm. Uh, pretty, pretty much feral at that yeah. point. Uh, yeah. Three is, like, really dumb. 
really, yeah. really fucking dumb. Right. Super goddamn dumb. <laughs> um, one and two is like what your wolves typically have, and your animals and your and your plants. Three is the equivalent, like, of a magic animal. Sure, like a warg. My actually, actually, a warg uh, is probably a little bit smarter than that. Like any mm-hmm. any celestial animals you summon, for instance, they're intelligent animals. They're magical animals. They'll have a a higher base intelligence of like three. So three yeah. would be like, oh, cool, I'm as smart as that celestial falcon right there. But it's still pretty pretty feral. Strength you can't have lower. Like a strength of zero, you'd be dead. I I can't lift anything. Yeah. A constitution Literally. of zero, again, you'd be dead. The only thing that's allowed to have a con of zero are undead. Oh, okay. Because they are, they're not alive. Right. <laughs> that, that's why they're um, dead. <laughs> they, don't, they don't need a con. They don't get any benefits from a con. Um, Do they need intelligence? Cri- Some. Some. Uh, okay. Vampires and liches are intelligent undead, so yes. But zombies probably no. Not so much. Not they so much. they probably have a. I don't know what zombies have in D anD D for a base intellect. Uh, um, low. <laughs> it's, I would I would put it low. between one and five personally. That's a guess. Oh, okay. Uh, dexterity, you could you could potentially not have it. Zero would again. You wouldn't necessarily be dead, but you would be very uncoordinated. The thing is that like when it comes to negative values that are that low. Since uh, since we were talking about like you know dice and, and mechanics and such, is that since you're getting such negatives to your dice rolls, you start to realize that it's really easy to fail things. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's make a deck saving throw. Uh... <laughs> What's your deck score? Three. K. Take your negative five. <laughs> yeah, here. I rolled a two. Five. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to make it really hard to avoid spells. <laughs> it's going to make it really hard to avoid anything. Yep, you, you're not going to be avoiding lightning very easily if you do that. I mean, most Sorry. people can't avoid that anyways, regardless of a dex of 20 or a dex of 5. <laughs> in, in terms of a lightning spell. like I mean, a little, I guess, yeah. Make your wisdom saving throw to stop my stunning strike. What's your wisdom yep. score? Yeah, again, uh, <laughs> will is one of those things, will and intellect, you don't usually have below three. Yeah. Uh, it could be five. They might have the base at, like, five, don't go lower than five. For or get used to being charmed. <laughs> yeah, get used <laughs> to lot. people taking advantage of you, believing everything, and yeah. being really, really easy to enchant. Yeah. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> so uh, now we know what not to do if you're building a character from scratch or using a point by system. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit because I've actually used a couple systems that use an exploding dice as, as a mechanic. Yes. Now, that kind of adds a whole other dimension to how number generation works for me. And I always feel like low quantity dice, like your D6s and D4s, actually work better in general. Um, but it, it's, kind, it's kind of hit or miss. Well, see, here's the thing with the exploding dice and the low sided dice have a higher chance to explode in that case right because if say you're rolling d4s and it's yeah. exploding d4s and you get an explosion on every four that you roll yeah well every time you roll that dice it's got a one in four chance right um yeah. again probability is not one in four we're rolling a four and a four and a four and a four that's not how that works but the point is right you do have a one in four chance when you roll a dice a d4 to get right. a four yeah, that's, your odds are higher. Yeah. That's just the way So when you roll D six, one D six is the same thing. You have better chance of getting a six than say you're rolling a twenty. And in the system I was actually designing, I actually used exploding criticals, but I did it on the twenties. Right. And that right. was because that had a um, a range that it went through uh to hit. And the criticals uh were exploding criticals. So if you rolled a critical and you got to roll the dice again to determine what type of critical it was and as you roll the critical range again, you could just keep doing that, and you could just make the dice explode and explode and explode. So instead of being a uh, like a damage dice that you're rolling and you explode to add more damage, yeah. this was a multiplier. So mm-hmm. you take your 2x multiplier and you, ex- you roll a critical, mm-hmm. and then it explodes, so it becomes a 3x, and then it explodes and becomes a 4x. So that was that was what I was doing, which, again, the point there is that you can you can turn it into this really really impressive and holy shit moment by yeah. doing that 
but the odds of doing it are increasingly rare, which right. is part of the reason it becomes an oh my god effect when it happens. I do. I, I actually like that idea, though, because that makes a lot of sense to me. Like, okay, so I, I roll a critical. Usually you figure you're doubling your damage. You know, at least your base damage, if you're looking at, like, a D&D. Um, okay, I roll another critical. Okay, well, now I'm tripling my damage. Like, this, that, that kind of makes sense. Uh, if you do a rollover system, like, I, I, I'm familiar with Open Legend. That has an exploding dice system. All the dice you roll can explode. Since it's a rollover system, that can get super powerful. Because if you have, like, a toughness of, let's say, 15, that your, your enemy has a, a thing of 15... You roll your critical on your d20. Okay, so you've rolled over for five points of damage. Now you can roll it again. And if you get a 20, that means that you have now already done 25 points of damage. <laughs> and you roll it again. And then you add that on. Uh, and, and that can kind of get completely nuts. Yeah. Where you can that... beat a boss in one turn. <laughs> And that's the thing, exploding criticals leave that unpredictability in there, mm -hmm. and the issue with that is that you can get really lucky, but also that if you play by the same rules and your your uh, bad guys are allowed to get those same dice and yeah. the same rolls, oh, yeah. then you have the the uh, possibility of a uh, level 1 mook, a goblin, coming up and shanking you for 30 times damage. Oh yeah. And it's like, you know, it should be something that should be able to happen. Sure. Um, sure. As again, with the system I was building, you roll the crit, and then to back up the critical, not like D&D &D where you either get a critical or you fail a critical by backing it up like it used right. to be. Right. Um, so you roll the critical threat, and then you see if, roll to confirm the crit, and so I, I made it so that the second roll isn't that you're rolling for critical damage, it's rolling to see the outcome of it. You hit a critical location, but the armor was still in the way as the first one. You got a crit. That's that's the thing. It's critical location is the first thing. So sort of like the first one, if you roll a critical, now you're you know that you're making a headshot basically. Yeah. Like so the first one's cases. like, all right, cool. I rolled a crit, so I'm making a headshot or a kidney shot. Yeah. yeah so I'm gonna back bad. this up. And yeah. the first one is like your armor or whatever is in the way. So you hit a critical location, but you still didn't hit it really hard. So it's the lowest outcome on that is that it's half damage. So that one is like, all right, cool. I hit a critical location, but instead of being a miss on the first part of that, it was now a blocked shot, essentially. The second one then becomes, instead of being a, a normal hit, it would become a critical hit. So you go, all right, cool. So I didn't miss, I got hit the critical location, and I actually get a, I do a normal hit. So it was, again, it's critical location, it didn't get bounced off by the armor, but it did do normal damage, it didn't do, like, full on. Mm. That was the second, it's still, these are really low chances for those ones. And sure. the normal one was, like, on the d20, you had eight different sides of the dice, mm. like, ten to eighteen. Yeah. That would be actually criticals. Okay. And then you would get to the other one where it's like, all right, cool. So you hit a critical location and you did a backup and you got another 1920. So hit the critical loca location way harder than just a normal critical hit. Yeah. So you're exploding that critical. Gotcha. And that's what that one was doing. Oh, okay. But now this is something I did not know. You're saying that uh, D&D &D had a backup system for, for criticals oh, at one point? Yeah. I uh, at 3.5, you had to roll your critical, and at that point, I believe 5e, everything's a crit on a 20 now, yeah? Yeah, it's a, you hit a 20, and that's a critical, and that's just that, that's the end of that. <laughs> okay, a, so you just get a critical. Before, period. weapons had a threat range. Oh, okay. So a scimitar, for instance, had a threat range of 18 to 20. You would oh, crit okay. yep. on a 18, 19, or 20. Mm-hmm. And then you could take feats and you could take weapon enchantments to fucking knock that down mm. to improve to critical or uh, whatever. And like people with scimitars would be going, hey, so I've got instead of a 18 to 20, you double the crit range and you've got like a 16 to 20. Ooh, so yeah, you'd be yeah. like people yep. would, would take scimitars and stuff for that reason. Or you take oh, a yeah. scythe, which does a 4x damage. On crit, but only on a 20, you take a proof critical, and then it becomes 1920. But to do that, you would have to roll a, like, scimitar example, or a longsword example was 19 to 20. Mm -hmm. um, 
At this point, you would roll a 19 or 20 on your dice. If it hits, it's then a critical, but you have to confirm the critical by doing the same thing again. Oh. I think. Was okay. it the same thing again? Either that or you had to actually hit them again. I don't... You had to a at while. least do a hit so yeah. that you can see that you did. Okay. It's, it's the back up the critical and you'd have to roll the dice again. And I think you just... I think you had to hit them again. Yeah. Like, you wouldn't hit them twice, but you would go, cool, I rolled a crit. All right, now back it up. Did you actually do it? It's did like, you? Oh, yeah. yeah, I totally did. On the point of this as well, here's a question for you, Nathan. Okay. When you're rolling a critical hit, do you multiply your damage before or after you add in your strength bonus or uh, modifiers? I believe what you're supposed to do is you double it before your modifier. See, I've had it done both ways. But I don't know the actual ruling on that. I think it's supposed to be whatever your damage die roll is, and then your modifier is on top of it. I, you know, that makes more sense, but I've also had people run it where it's, all right, no, no, no. You take your damage die, add your modifiers to it, and then, and you then double, double yeah. that. Which would be like, amazing. <laughs> which is way more damage. <laughs> oh, hell yeah, because, like, <laughs> my very punchy uh, turtle has a strength of 20. So I get a plus five for my bonus. And that plus five, if you double it, is ten. That's significant. So Nathan, um, remember, yeah. remember that boar story? Yeah, I remember that one. Remember that boar story when <laughs> yeah. I killed two, two characters with that with one the, boar? With the one boar, Because it was yeah. dire boar? Yeah. That was rolling, that was a boar that rolled a critical hit uh -huh. on its gore attack. Yeah. Which was 2d8. Yeah. Times two, plus eight. And I rolled max damage on that, so it was 16 times 2, 32 plus 8 equals 40 damage. What level were they at the time? They were like level 3. <laughs> okay, so that's pretty much... I went, yeah, so the, the tusk, essentially I went, so that tusk yeah. just, I'm like, make a reflex save. At the, a dexterity uh -huh. saving throw at this point. Mm -hmm. It would be 5e. I was like, um, this is gonna hurt. I'm like, I'm gonna allow you to make a, a dexter a, a reflex save to see if you can like take half damage from this. Right. Because it hits. Oh boy. But you're going to be like, oh shit! Yeah. Uh, and one of them actually made it, but it still did more... 20 damage was still more than the max HP that he had, and I was like, I'm not... Like, I shouldn't even allow you to get a reflex save on this thing, but I'm letting you. Because, uh... Because it's, cause it's going sad. through the person in front of you. Maybe you can jump out of the way while it, it, it engorges your team. Well, here's the thing. <laughs> Yeah. You don't have two elves, and then go, I'm gonna stand behind the other one to hide. Elves are tiny. <laughs> you... A charging boar is fast, and those dire yeah. boar tusks are like three feet long. It's also not a great team-building exercise. I mean... <laughs> stand behind your teammate. Let them die for you. It's I mean, a trust it exercise. it didn't work, because they both died. No, they both died. I'm not positive, but I do think I remember that there are still weapons in 5e. That can, or, or, oh, I think that it's specific skills that you can take depending on what character class you are. I think the fighter might have one. Where Probably. you can increase your critical range to like 19 to 20. Like you double, you can double your critical range. Um, yeah, that would make sense. I, I think that that's a thing. I remember it from KOTOR. In KOTOR, uh, depending on what lightsaber you were using. Oh, well, yeah, the KOTOR yeah. system is totally based on the 3.5 it's, it's, it's based on 3.5. Or the, or the T. Either that or 2e. It, yeah. it was essentially a, a d20, yeah. but with d6s for all the dice. Aside right. from the two hit dice and the skill checks. Right, right, right. Yeah, the more I know about 3.5, uh, I, I really feel like it was based primarily off of that. It really was, I believe. I've played a little bit of KOTOR, and, and I'm pretty sure it was 3.5 or yeah. 3.0. Yeah. And there's also um, skills that you can take that do like improved criticals. But those were actually like a mapped action that you took if you want to try to do an imp a critical attack. Yeah, it wasn't just a, a flat that. improvement to your critical hit chance because no. <laughs> let's face it, if you could have done that in Kotor, oh boy, well that would have been that would have been a really quick game. I'm trying to remember because I think the second game where you could do a lot more modification to your lightsaber, I think there were some components you could add that would double whatever your current uh, critical threat range was. So if you already had one that had like a an eighteen to twenty, and you doubled that threat range, you were in yeah. pretty good shape. You well, might I mean, be. They, the opponent wasn't. No, they weren't.
I actually think that it was more common to see it on short lightsabers, which don't do as much damage. Oh, I think that was to make up for the fact they didn't do as much damage. <laughs> that it's really a lot. <laughs> when it comes to exploding dice systems, though, I prefer to have a lot of smaller dice. I'd rather have, like, a bunch of small dice rather than a large one. Uh, one, because obviously you're going to have a better chance of rolling over. Um, but, you know, your general average is going to be better. I'd really rather be rolling three sixes than a, than a d20, obviously. My odds are much better of getting at least one of them to explode. Yeah. And my odds were better in the first place. Um, I've actually heard tales from uh, the Open Legion community where uh, one of their uh, characters was killed, like, uh, right out of the gate by a withered skeleton that, that rolled, like, two d20s in a row. <laughs> Yeah, um, that'll happen sometimes. And uh, it's like, yeah. Usually, usually it was, uh, I don't know if that's a house rule, but if somebody did uh, 3D20s and got them 20-20-20, typically you'd be dead. I uh, I like the idea that if you had a rollover system and they were using it for something like Curse of Strahd or something for like D&D, &D, where, you, where you, just, you, you just roll up to Strahd at like level one and you're just like, hey bud. <laughs> just, you just happen to roll like a, a one in 8,000, I think is the odds of doing three d20s in a row. Was um, Strahd a vampire? Yeah, I think Strahd was a vampire. Yeah, he's immune to critical hits. That doesn't work. Oh, well, hey, it was a nice idea while we... <laughs> I kept thinking to myself, like, if you gave me the option of keeping, like, my d4s as the thing that I could use for, for an exploding system, I think I'd prefer it. There is, of course, the one thing where if I had a d6, my odds of getting 1 to 6 are pretty good. If I get a d4, even if I roll over it, though, I'm still probably not going to hit, like, 6. Like, my probability is pretty low to actually hit up to that. Yeah. But it is a more likely scenario that I'm going <laughs> to at least get to that second tier. I know it's a bit of a trade-off, but... And I know that there are a lot of systems, too, maybe not ones that I've played particularly, that have fairly large dice pools that you pull from. Isn't it like uh, Legend of the Five Rings that has, like, a whole, like, sphere of dice, practically, that you roll? A sphere of dice? Or, or a whole... Th th there's a bunch of dice you have to roll for, like, dice pools. L5R was the roll-and-keep system I was telling you about okay, before. Okay, yeah. But they weren't necessarily huge, but, I mean, they were still roll-and-keep. Right. Um, on the other hand, Warhammer 40k, whoo, that can be a gar gargantuan block of dice you have to roll. How many guardsmen you got? 40. How many shots do each of them take? Two. <laughs> oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> That's, I wish that was an exaggeration. What would you consider, out of curiosity, too many dice? Like, like more, more than that. What would you consider just an obscene level of dice mechanics? In a game. An, obs an obscene level of dice mechanics? Yeah, just where, where dice mechanics are like, okay, this is too much. I think any game that goes out of its way to have multiple dice systems in it would be too much. Like, say you've got a d20 system in there, but yeah. you also make a roll and keep system in there, but then you also make exploding dice in there. It's too confusing. It's, it's, it's a bit much. Yeah, it's too many things to keep track of at one time. Uh, yeah, a little bit. If there's one-offs, like, okay, you got your d20 for your hits and your skill checks, but then your damage dice can explode, for instance, that's not so bad. Yeah. Like, I can see how that would be okay. But then if you got, like, the roll and keep system, so it's like, oh, you've got, for every level, or every proficiency you've got in the skill, for instance, or every level of mastery into the skill, you get an extra d20, and it's, uh, you roll all the d20s and you keep the best outcome. That's like, all right, well, we already made advantage a thing. That's just advantage plus. Yeah, when when games have more than just the core dice mechanic and they just add mechanic on mechanic on mechanic, thankfully, I don't think a lot of people do that, but it's, no. it's unnecessary. No. It's really and, unnecessary. And, and the thing that worries me about that is at some point, you do think that those different kinds of dice mechanic are going to have to interact with each other, and that can become real unpredictable when you have multiple systems. Um, it it just it it feels like that you're you're creating more problems than you're trying to solve. <laughs> uh, my general thought is. Uh, and, and people might have different philosophies when it comes down to it, but that dice mechanics, generally game mechanics in general, are supposed to motivate and, and really fuel 
the uh, game that you're playing not get in the way of it. And I think that the level you're talking about is where the entire game is just figuring out number systems. <laughs> yeah, that's not so much fun. No. And it's, I think it's the reason why, as we talked about on the show before, so many times you see an absolute streamlining of those mechanics to make it as simple and easy to understand and comprehensive as possible. And not yeah. complicating it more. And uh, in a lot of those cases, too, it's not just dice mechanics that are getting simplified, it's other mechanics as well. Oh, yeah. I know, like, again, I love the system they made for Warhammer 40k, uh, for the Final Fantasy game it's made, but it's so super crunchy, and it's just, there's so much going on that interacts with each other in not good meshing ways. Yeah. It's like, alright, so you have to roll your percentile to hit, but you can also take any of these actions here, and these actions here to modify your role. Yeah. It's like, all right, well, I, I, and then you've got, like, your skill, so it's like, I, I'm rolling, all right, let's see. I have to roll under 70 to hit, and then I'm taking an aim shot, full round aim, half round aim, full round aim. Do I pick which one do I want? So yeah. you go, all right, well, I'll take a full round aim, and I'll, you take your full action to mm. aim the shot, and you get a plus 10 to your skill, so you're rolling under an 80 now, yeah. or whatever. And then you go, cool, and, and this other person has a, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. a lot. <laughs> the super crunchy ones can be really fun. Yeah. But it's, it's, you have to be able to mitigate that crunch. You have to be able to make it work and not take forever. Otherwise, you slog. You start to forget what your game actually is. Because you're spending so much time in the weeds of the, of the things that you are doing. And that's one of those things, too, where combat encounters in games tend to take a while. Oh, yeah. Especially large combats. Mm -hmm. And if you've got all these different dice mechanics interacting with each other and different types of abilities and things that aren't just spells, but like special effects and all this stuff going on, it really just slugs everything down to a crawl. There's been times where you have minor skirmishes, like two or three or four, potentially in a in a game. Yep. You know, you'll have smaller combats, mm -hmm. but then you'll have, like, a boss battle, and it takes a whole session. And then it takes the whole next session, because you weren't done. You're going to end up, like, Goku casting a fucking spirit bomb. It's going <laughs> to take six weeks. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you're going to have to draw all the energy from everyone on Earth to get this shit done. The problem, too, is that if you have systems like that where... Uh, each player's turn is going to take an inordinate amount of time to figure out what they do. It's kind of boring for all the other players that are around the table. <laughs> yeah. And see, that's, that's again, where we go to actual Warhammer territory there. It's, all right, so we're taking turns separately. I'm taking my turn, then you're taking your turn. I'm taking my turn, then you're taking your turn. In the meantime, each turn lasts like a half hour. Because it's like, all right, I need to... Move all my units, do all these move actions, all these actions, all these other actions. Oh, now I'm shooting. Oh, now I'm going to either yeah. skip shooting and assault and charge you. Now I'm doing melee combat. Now we're both doing melee combat. Now we're rolling saving throws. Yeah. It's, I really enjoy Warhammer, but it's such a long process, especially when you're rolling 40 dice. Yeah. And you're going, all right, I have to pick out all these dice. Okay, how many of these hits? And then, cool. And then you have the, then you go, all right, I hit you 20 times out of the 40. I need you to make 10 uh, saving throws and five invulnerable saving throws. Okay. <laughs> and then five guys are outright dead or outright take wounds. It's a lot of bookkeeping. It's a lot yeah. to denote. And, and I love it, but... A simplification yeah. of that, again, goes a long way. Right. Because in in the actual Warhammer thing, you're talking about the actual like strategy wargaming part yes, of that. Yes, the tabletop yeah. miniature game. The miniature game. is You're, you're controlling armies at that point. So yes. you really have to be uh, aware of like how many troops you have in a movement. <laughs> and, something like that. and it's like, oh, are all those in squad cohesion? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, Can you measure them all? Fuck. I've got 40 guys. Yeah, war, war gaming in general Are there all <laughs> usually is where you see the overcomplexity of mechanics uh, yeah, seep in a there, lot. There's, there's a lot of that. That's why we were talking about last time where Magic the Gathering uh, doesn't have that complexity because 
each set adds new features that are standalone features. Yeah. They don't have to mesh with other mechanics that the game has brought to it. Correct. That yeah. works. Yeah. But when you've got these things that all have to interact with each other and mesh and work together well, mm. it's, it's a lot harder. At some point, maybe we'll get into a conversation about how you could uh, simplify and streamline war games. That would be interesting. I mean, I, I could have a very long conversation about that. Yeah. I think we can do it for a, a live show sometime. Oh, yeah, that would be good. That would be fun. So one other thing, it's kind of a, it's kind of a silly thing. Uh, an aesthetic thing, but I, I did want to get your uh, opinion on it. Uh, so I've been thinking a lot about the D4, okay? The, 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 the Caltrops. Caltrops. The Caltrops, okay? I've been thinking about this. You know what's interesting about the D4 compared to any of the other dice is that it's like the one die that you don't actually read face up. It's, you either read it from the side uh, that, that's facing up, or you read it from the bottom. I've seen ones that actually go by the bottom. Yeah, or... you, can, you can read it depending on which way it's, it's patterned. Yes. You either read the top, or you read the base. Yeah, yeah. Whatever's facing upward <laughs> is basically what you're looking at. But I started thinking about, like, could you make a D4 that didn't actually work that way? And I had a couple ideas about how you could do it. You could either flatten out your tips and put the numbers on it, of course, then it's kind of a D8. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, I, I, mean, I mean, if you made them small enough so that they don't actually count as like a side, like the odds of you landing on them are very low, but they're big enough that you could put a number on them. But if you're a traditionalist, I know that that's going to be technically a D8 for you. But then the other thing I thought about, and I don't think I've seen this dice design yet, is if you imagine a leaf. So like, you, you know, your, your typical leaf, it's like pointed at both ends. If you took four of those and kind of like wrapped them around, you'd be basically creating like a D6 that had two pinched sides, and it would have to land on one of four sides that are all even. Um, pretty sure that's a thing. It that's is? A, uh, they, they have prism dice. Oh, okay. That look kind of like a, like a quartz crystal, oh. if, you, if you will. Oh, okay. Um, they have some like that. So they're, they're, they're not dice you would roll like rounds, they are elongated like crystalline looking dice yeah um, and so each facing uh, would land face up it's only got like a d4 can be done that way yeah not that like you really necessarily need to try and improve upon a caltrop which is you know a simple and you know well, easy the to understand other side. one i've seen too is like a spinning dice almost i think you can spin it oh yeah yeah um, yeah almost like a top but it has the yeah but but much thinner okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um it's almost like a throwing knife looking thing. Mm. It's small. Yeah, and you yeah. can spin it on the point, and each of the sides has a number, and whatever it lands face up on. Yeah. I've, I've seen those too. Yeah, and I've seen like the cylinder kind of thing too, you know, like what's yeah. yeah, you, you can put there, any number sides of, on it. Yeah. There's all sorts of non polyhedral, like almost round shapes. Right. That you can do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like I was talking about at the beginning is that like, yeah, technically you can have dice that have any number of sides if you really wanted it to. Yeah. And Actually, I know uh, um, Michael Stevens, I think it was an episode of Ding or Dong, as it used to be called, oh. or it could have been an episode of Vsauce. He actually did something about the polyhedrals, which would tie into dice shapes very well. Go check that out if you have not seen it. Uh, we're not going to post the link because I don't remember where it is. That's fine. Go check out Vsauce uh, or Ding. It used to be Dong. Do online now, guys. Oh. But they changed it because it was not... Um, <laughs> you, it was probably not ad-friendly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And even though it had been a channel for several years. Now it's Do Internet Now, guys. <laughs> Do inside now, guys. Do inside now, guys. You don't want to go outside. Outside's for losers. Um, you know the other die that I saw, and I don't know if you've seen these before, but D30s. Have you seen the D30s? Unnecessary. Before? Unnecessary. <laughs> it's hard to do percentages <laughs> with D30s. Yeah. It yeah, doesn't it evenly it doesn't um, evenly work. Yeah. No, because threes don't go into a hundred. Yeah. It only works if you want your probability to be even thinner than a D20. <laughs> Maybe if somebody was like, you know, wanted to be abstractionist and not do what, what like D&D &D and other D20 systems said and tried to make a system around a D30 instead, just to say like, yeah, we're going to try to create an even swingier system. 
that I mean, it. you could do it. Oh, yeah. Nathan. Yeah. I feel like the way you'd want to do it is you'd want to have three types of outcomes you could have. Yes. A pass, a fail, and a in-between. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're going to make this mechanic right now. D30? Uh, is 1 to 10. Is it going to be 1 to 30 or 0 to 30? Uh, no, probably 1 to 30. Like, it's a 1 okay. to 20. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so it's a 1 to 30. So 1 to 10 is a fail Okay. in the system. Yep. 11 to 20, depending on which side of that is, yeah. is a pass or fail. Yeah. It's a mediocre, it's not quite a success, not quite a fail. Like a glance, maybe. 21 yeah. to 30 is a pass. Okay. What happens in the middle there is where everything below a 10 is a, a 10 or below is actually a fail, and everything 21 and above is actually a success. It's, you have that varied in the middle where uh, anything below, like a Anything 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 mm -hmm. is like a fail, but not like a super fail, like a partial fail. Right. Everything 16 to 20 is like a partial success. Depending on what you wanted to accomplish, you could do criticals, hits, glances, and like on, That's on both That's the word. Sides. Thank you. Glances. I was thinking of glance. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what's interesting, and I've never seen this done before, but here's another, like, evil mechanic that you could put in place, <laughs> is sort of like how you have uh, criticals for, for success that you could, like, roll over or do, like, exploding criticals for success. What about if you had exploding critical fails? <laughs> I mean, you could. Yeah. I don't see why not. It depends. Are we talking about damage or, like, each time? Oh, if you, anytime... like, get a critical fail, you roll a one. Yeah. You roll the dice again. You and you get another one. Yeah. Your fail becomes more spectacular. Oh, yeah. Your fails just get worse and worse. Like, you have to roll... You roll your one for your critical fail, and then you roll it again, and if your die roll is really bad on that, it explains exactly how bad you... <laughs> and oh, I mean, you hold what we again. would call that is not exploding. We'd call it a magnitude die. Okay. But if you hit, like, a one again... Now we've, like, 2 x your your badness. Yeah, <laughs> so what we do is we call this a magnitude die. Mm-hmm. So you go, if you crit, succeed, or crit, fail, you roll your magnitude, and you want to see how high or how low that magnitude is. Right. So if you roll a, tw a, a crit, and then you roll a 20, you've got a magnitude of 20. If you roll a 1, you've got a mag magnitude of 1. So it's the l lowest critical you can have. Like, it adds a few points of damage. Sure. Um... And then if you roll a critical fail, it's like, all right, well, again, the one or one to, would it work the same scale or would you reverse the scale? Would you roll, all right, I rolled a one crit fail, now I need to roll my magnitude die? Oh, be, yeah, yeah, yeah. A 20 is a magnitude 20 failure? Yeah. Or to be, a one no, is I, a magnitude. I, no, I think because you're, cause you're scaling down, you'd have to be using your one as your worst magnitude. A 20, you might no, be okay. No, see, I think that would get confusing, because you'd be like, wait, is the, I think you'd want to keep that dice the same mechanic either way. You know, so you've got a, a critical failure, and then you've got a magnitude 20 critical failure. Like, it's a fucking critical failure. You know what you could do? Here's a thought. You could have, this actually might be where a D100 comes in really useful. Oh boy. Is, That's a real magnitude. Well, but you know what I was thinking about is, I think it's, um... Is, is it Warlock that can do the wild magic? Is, is it a uh, uh, sorcerer. Or sorcerer. You know how they have that table? Uh-huh. Yeah, where you roll... I think it's a D100 that you roll for that. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, you roll that, and it determines, like, what the, the thing is that happens. I'm thinking oh. of that for a failure. Like, you roll your failure. I mean, you could do that, Yeah. Then, then it's less abstract, and you'd want this to be abstract. Yeah, I suppose so, um, but I could see, like, see, where if you rolled a failure and then you hit a one when you rolled it again. Like, see, they, they here's the thing, Nathan, if you really wanted something similar to that, we'd have to go back again to the Warhammer 40k systems, mm. where they had critical charts. Okay. Lots of critical charts. Critical charts for each type of weapon. So you say you roll your critical with the weapon, and then you consult your critical hit chart. I think if you like kill them with it or something like that, and it goes from a one to a hundred, and it, uh, there's no chill on that scale. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like at fifteen, an arm is blown off yeah. and die of shock. <laughs> This is called the no chill system. <laughs> At like a hundred, they're completely vaporized and they explode, dealing damage to everyone around them. Perfect. 
Yeah. Uh, I don't remember exactly, like, per details of them, but there are ones where, like, bone chunks come out and actually splinter into anyone in, like, a 10-yard radius. Oh, God. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's something to think about. I am, uh, I'm, I'm really interested in now building the, the masochist, like, uh, uh, RPG system, where we just, like, have, like, magnitudes for critical fails, and we implement all of these, like, like, the, take the lowest number die in a die pool system, and just make it so horrible for people that, that is absolutely Lovecraftian, like, Call of Cthulhu territory. Yeah, I think... That's uh, just trying to make Fatal look, like, not so bad anymore. <laughs> well, I feel like we have uh, been able to explore uh, definitely in more depth than the first time around uh, dice mechanics on this episode. So, if uh, people would want to roll a critical success for Delve and see all of the things that they can look at, where could they go? Our Patreon! Yeah, you could go there. <laughs> is that not the right answer? Oh, that oh, is a critical You can success, find yeah. all of our things over at delvecast.com. Yeah. And our link to our Patreon is there too. For a one dollar a month, mm -hmm. uh, you can help us keep the lights on and Yeah. And we also have other uh things that we'd want to do for shows and uh yes. you know, being a uh, encouraging us to uh to make more content, that's always handy. You roll a critical success if you uh if you're on our Patreon. You, that's that, true that is true thank you to all of uh, the people that are on our patreon who rolled a critical success especially our shiny level patrons they did a double 20 that's how they work uh dominic perry and bonnie ainsworth thanks for rolling double crits that was pretty great also you can find us on itunes and uh google play and Spotify. And Spotify. Yeah, you can find us on Spotify, iHeartRadio, and a whole bunch of other places. Everywhere you find podcasts, you can find us. Um, I was also alerted to the fact that apparently, <laughs> you saw this, that there's apparently a, a, a podcast uh, app in India that has now picked up Orbital, and I didn't even know it existed before. <laughs> So apparently they like to listen to uh, alternate history. They apparently like to listen to like science fiction history, which is uh, is great. I know I have to work on those too because I I haven't been at it for a while. We've been working on a lot of other things, folks. Sorry, I know I have to get back to it. There there are some people that are looking forward to it, but uh, you can find us all uh, on there. Uh, please rate and review and subscribe. We always appreciate that. And uh, you can also find us on Twitter. I am at Citanium. I am at EXP Limited, and the show is at Delve Podcast. Yep, you can find us there. And uh, so enjoy. We try to keep you informed about uh, not just this show, but all the other projects that we work on throughout the week. Uh, so enjoy that. Uh, if you want to see me playing through Borderlands 3, well, you're going to get a lot of that <laughs> in the next week or so. Next couple weeks, you're going to definitely be seeing more of it. I'm going to do a proper outro, and I have to roll a die to see which outcome I'm going to use. Okay, so I roll my d20. Okay, I rolled my d20, and I got a 2. This outro is going to uh, suck. Oh, you're, you're almost in critically fail. I'm almost in critically fail. Purple Monkey Dishwasher! That's my outro. It With a 2. All right, then. Purple Monkey Dishwasher, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye.